Our next speaker is Khalil Ali. He's from Philly. He currently works with the Philadelphia Community Institute of Africana Studies. It's a nonprofit university, a university without walls. Its purpose is to educate the public on African American history, life, and culture. Khalil was twice Deputy Minister of Defense for the Republic of New Africa, a radio talk show host on WPEB and WURD, and a founding member of the Coalition to Empower Communities. Please give a warm welcome to Khalil Ali. Thanks a lot. And uh, I'm really happy to be here uh, for multiple reasons. I was just telling one of my uh, co-panelists that most of the places I speak to, uh, you have a lot of people who have struggled over the years and they just talk to each other. And it's not a recycling of new people and interchanges of different experiences. So this is a, a, a great thing. Uh, in planning for today, I thought about two things. So I actually did two separate things and I'm gonna make them one. Um, we have a tradition in uh, African spirituality, and when we mention the ancestors, we say Ashe. Since we're talking about the history of the civil rights movement in Philadelphia, we're talking about over 300 years of struggle of African American people struggling in this city. This is one of the oldest and most continuous uh, black uh, populations in the country. Mother Bethel Church down at Six and Lombard is the longest held, continuously held piece of real estate held by African Americans in the country. So we have struggled for a long time. Uh, one of the first people that comes to mind is a, a, a person that I was just studying about last night, James Fortin. He was uh, they called the privateer. Uh, during the War of 1812, uh, he was on a ship that was actually uh, leased. It was a private ship that was leased by the United States government as they were fighting the British. But this brother struggled. Uh, his name was James Fortin, F-O-R-T-E-N. He struggled. Uh, in that war, he was captured by the British. He wouldn't, they wanted him to swear allegiance to the crown. He wouldn't do it. So what he did, did his time in prison, he came back to the United States, and he actually opened up his own uh, shipping company. And he became one of the wealthiest men in the city, but he used his wealth to free slaves, to build schools for African Americans, and to create uh, a freedom fighting organization. So when we say James uh, Fortin, I would like everyone to say Ashe. Ashe. Okay. Uh, another one, I just got her name. She was William Penn's secretary slave. And she used the war, the Revolutionary War, uh, to negotiate her freedom. Her name was Donna. And uh, we don't have a last name for her, but because there was a, a fear of the British would use the slaves in Philadelphia to revolt. She negotiated a truce with her slave master to set her free, and she started a movement called negotiation, and a lot of African Americans used that to get free, and it did it so much until they had the largest population of free black people in this country. So when we say Donna, I would like to hear our shay. And everybody knows about William Steele. Right? No, William no. Steele, he was uh, one of the uh, conductors of the Underground Railroad. One of the places he built, my mother used to be the executive, executive director there at the YMCA at 1724 Christian Street. That was built by William Steele and his family. Okay? Uh, right across the street from there, that's where um, the Sigma Pi Five, one of the oldest uh, black fraternal groups in the country, was actually started. But William Steele started. Uh, his, his portion of the Underground War Railroad was the General Vigilance Committee. And they assisted runaways, not only just to run away with food, cold, clothing, and shelter, but also legal assistance. They actually went into courts and knocked the fugitive uh, uh, status of some slaves. So when we say William Steele, we should say Ashe. Ashe. And everyone knows about um, Richard Allen. This is Richard Allen City and Absalom Jones. And we know that they started uh, down here at Six and Lumber Bar, Bar Mother Bethel Church. And they were also conductors of the Underground Railroad. And they went into 
the state legislatures to fight to overthrow slavery. So we can say Williams, uh, Richard Allen and Absalom Jones, Ashe. And how about Octavius Cato? Everyone knows he was killed down on South Street in a race riot, but he was actually part of a, uh, a group that recruited African Americans into the military during the Civil War, and his wife, Caroline, was the first Rosa Parks of the country. Uh, she refused to um, give up her seat on a trolley car and started a rebellion down on 6th and, and, and uh, South um, that actually changed some of the laws here in this um, city. So when we say Octavius Cotto and Caroline Cotto, Ashe. Ashe. And Henry Minton. Henry Minton gets beat up in our community. Uh, one of uh, my closest friends, uh, he always attacks this group, uh, Sigma Pi Phi, the Boule. They're the black elite. But Henry Minton was uh, a dynamic person. He was uh, a physician, uh, he was a pharmacist. He opened up the second black hospital in the country, which was Mercy Hospital. The first was Frederick Douglass Hospital, mm -hmm. and they merged. That's where we get Mercy Douglass. And when we hear about the, the, the Mercy healthcare system, this is what we're talking about. Sure. Started right on Christian Street, 17th and Christian, where actually the Boulé started. And he not only did, did that, he was also a supporter of a lot of humanitarian causes. He stood up for the rights of women, and he created Sigma Pi Phi to be what uh, he to be another skull and bones for African Americans, uh, where he believed, as the boys once believed in the talented tips should lift the race up, and that's what it was designed to do. But as we know, things change as we go along. So Henry Minton, I would like to say Hashe, and I'm gonna leave it right there because I I did a whole lot all the way up until this time, but we don't have enough time for that. Um, and another time. <laughs> okay. But, and just listening to some of the speakers, uh, a few years ago I wrote an, an article in Black Star newspaper. Anybody familiar with that newspaper? The Black Star? Uh, a brother here by the name of Henry D. Bernardo, he publishes it. Um, at times. <laughs> at times it exists. But um, if something happens, we'll get it out. But this article I wrote shook a lot of people up. And it was about how the current political structure in Philadelphia came, developed. Um, and, and I didn't really get too far into it. But I'm going to start back in 1966. A man came here to Philadelphia. His name was George McBundy. He was head of the Ford Foundation. And we know the Ford Foundation uh, was in league with the various uh, security apparatuses of the United States government, both internationally and domestically. Uh, some of the people they hired was Richard Bissell, who worked with Alan Dulles and, and uh, John McCloy, and some of these people, who actually got court funneling money from the CIA to the Ford Foundation. Well, he came to Philadelphia, and he talked to African Americans about black power and about taking black power and actually creating a uh, better life for themselves. Um, but actually, it was about co-opting co people. Ford Foundation and, and some of the people who've been in the movement for a long time, they ward up a lot of people, and a lot of people left the movement to be ahead of different foundations. They got funding from Ford Foundation and other groups. Well, they came here to Philadelphia to create an elite group it was very difficult to do it because uh, the economics of Philadelphia was changing also. We had a lot of the various factories they were leaving. You had automation that was taking a lot of low skill and semi-skilled labor uh, jobs just right off the market. So a lot of people couldn't get jobs. And they saw that this group, as uh, James Box called them, the outsiders, were actually organized. And they were organized by various forces. One of the forces was a group called RAM, the Revolutionary Action Group, uh, who were, was actually led at that time by, and 
founded by a mentor of mine, Dr. Muhammad Ahmed, who was Max Stanford then, who was born and raised here in Philadelphia, and um, had to leave the city because of his activity in, in challenging the, the power structure. But uh, they came here to found this group. I have 10 minutes, so I'm gonna be real quick. Um, and what happened, they looked at these locked out people and they said, you know what, we could use them. And they used them as a reactionary force in the community to criminalize people, okay? So in this article, I talked about a meeting that Frank Rizzo and some of the power elite people had in this city. And I talked about Frank Rizzo's connection to organized crime. And he was head, he was the mayor, he was head of the police department, and he was head of the, uh, he was also police commissioner before he was mayor. And how he got there through a person by name, uh, a reporter by the name of Albert Gaduzio, who wrote all of these investigative articles in the newspapers, okay? He worked for the Bulletin. Philadelphia has a history of organized crime in newspapers. Mm -hmm. The Daily News and Inquirer were owned by the Annenbergs, who were into gambling, loan sharking, and what they would do is write articles against their competition to create public outrage against their competition. The police will lock them up and they get more territory. So we're still in that now because the Daily News was brought <coughs> just recently by Bart Blackstein. Anybody know who that is? He's a developer. Okay, so the stories that you get in the Daily News is about helping the process of gentrifying Philadelphia. Okay, but the same thing was done uh, to help Rizzo become police commissioner. Now he was the supervising lieutenant. This, he made captain without ever passing a test. But he, but he was the supervising lieutenant down on 13th Street, was, was a red light district, where all kinds of vice happened. Mm -hmm. So how do you get promoted without a test, without with, 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 uh, in an area that the mafia controlled? And then when he became mayor, he made the managing director, a man named Levinston, who was the lawyer for two clubs that were on 13th Street, the Russian Inn, and the HMS Pinafore. Anybody old enough to remember those clubs? Mm -hmm. Okay. They were bad, right? They were bad. Okay. Well, the mafia owned them. The two guys who owned them was a guy named Salvatore Sam the Barber La Russa, mm -hmm. who would actually, they called him that because they said he cut up people real bad, mm -hmm. and Sam the Rose. And I can tell you who told me this story because I used to be a prison guard and I met Long John Mortarano. He gave me the whole thing. So, so he should know he was uh, one of the wow. richest men in the world when they arrested him. Um, and this guy was managing director over 10 city departments with his connections to the mafia. Okay, now we also have Rizzo's chief fundraiser J. Harrison Jones, he was the chairman of Continental Bank. Anybody know about Continental Bank, yes. right? Yes. There's a book about Continental Bank being the Mafia's bank. Yes. Well, yes. Continental Bank was linked to uh, M. Maggio and C Company. And this company, uh, and this was linked by a grand jury. The company was owned by Peter Maggio, the brother-in-law of Angelo Bruno. Everybody knows who Angelo Bruno was, right? He was the Mafia guy. Okay, now the 1970 grand jury found that Continental Bank lent the cheese distribution, uh, that's Maggio cheese, more than a million dollars to gain special influence. Now I ask you, what special influence could Angelo Br Bruno's brother-in-law offer the bank? <laughs> right, right? Okay, that might be one. So, DA, all inspector, remember him, yeah. right? He inv investigated a bill that was brought to uh, brought into the city council by William Cottrell, used to be the city council person here in South Philly, mm -hmm. uh, which would allow Maggio Cheese Factory to expand in his district, right? Cottrell was quoted saying that he didn't believe in the mafia. However, James Tate warned city council against the bill because the rackets were involved. 
Okay? When called on the carpet about the bill, he said he didn't know that the bill was for Maggio Cheese. Now, the, one of the partners of Maggio Cheese was uh, a, a brother, Mario Ma uh, Maggio. He was called before a grand jury for loan sharking and gambling and using money, using that money to purchase land for urban development. Okay? Isn't this what we're going through? Right now. Okay, so we need to start chasing some of the money where this came from. Okay, Continental Bank also had connections to uh, William H. Flummer and Sons, which was a beer distributor in Schuylkill, right? Mm -hmm. And these people got in trouble for taking money that was for urban development and using it to expand their beer factory. Uh, Joseph Ortley, and they owned a brewery, Ortley's Beer. Mm -hmm. Okay, Robert J. Williams was vice president of Continental Bank, and all of these people I'm mentioning, all of them were on the board of Continental Bank, and these were the same people uh, in the book about the Vatican Bank, uh, the Continental Bank is Bank of America now, uh, that was connected with organized crime all over the world. Okay, now I'm, I'm gonna talk about Long John, Mar um, Long John Mariano. Um, he was, the connection, Angelo Bruno worked for him. And Angelo Bruno kept the mafia out of the drug trade. But he was getting money from the richest, one of the richest, he was the seventh richest man in the world from selling drugs here in Philadelphia, Long John Mortarano. And Long John um, gave Bruno his cut. So Bruno's people were angry with them because they couldn't get in on the mob trade, That's, um, on the drug trade. That's why they killed them. But if they weren't selling drugs in the Italian community, guess where they were selling them? In the black community. In the black community. They used to meet at 62nd and Walnut. Long John and some people, uh, Russell uh, Schultz talks about they used the Nation of Islam. Long John told me he used to pay Jeremiah the buses to go to Chicago. He would pay for it. Jeremiah would take the believer's money and put it in his pocket. Okay? I know that's upsetting some people. But that's what happened. And they, they sold drugs in our communities. And that was part of the COINTELPRO program. Because you got to remember that COINTELPRO mentioned the Nation of Islam as one of the groups it wanted to take down. The purpose of COINTELPRO, they said, was to stop violence on the behalf of black organizations. Well, if it was doing that, how could they allow a black mafia just to run free here in Philadelphia? Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. And they didn't get prosecuted like the Black Panther Party, mm -hmm. who was stripped nude in the middle of the street. Mm -hmm. Okay? They weren't bombed like the Moo family was bombed in, in the streets. Okay? So we have to make a strong stand to be a moral people because what has happened, some of our people who we say, you know, there ain't no jobs out here. And that's true, it's not. It was a plan to really get, they knew, they knew that automation would take jobs away from people, and they wanted to divert our people's revolutionary thrust to a criminal thrust. Mm -hmm. Russell Schultz has a new book out, but this is a pamphlet. This book here is a little, little, little booklet called Liberation or Gangsterism, Freedom or Slavery. He now has a whole full-length book where he talks about the criminalization of black youth and the movie Superfly. Curtis Mayfield talked about the reason why he made that soundtrack was to, they were advertising the drugs because they knew high unemployment was coming and they knew that they needed a, a, a um, alternative to keep people from struggling against them so they use drugs. So we, when we look at fighting against drugs, and demonstrating against drugs, we have to look at it from a social and political and economic standpoint and not blame the victim, but we need to call out the system and its role that it played in the creation of the very gangs that led for a lot of these young people to be arrested. Because a lot of those people who were doing stuff for Jeremiah who died as an old man are in jail and they'll never get out. They will never get out and they never saw any of the money that they turned over. Okay, so thank you, I'm finished. <laughs>